This is how the book looks like. Okay. All these notes are available online. Dhammafella.org. So you can download your own copy, or maybe you have your own hard copies. All right, this topic is a very important topic. This is one word that can summarize the whole of Buddhism. If you like, so if you look at the subtitle. A Buddhist perspective on friendship, humanity, and life. So, because love is one of the most misunderstood abuse of words, no? because people like to define it in their own way, or they have a very narrow view of it. But uh, today we're going to look at this word as an overview. So, for for, for us, for Buddhists. Why is love so important? Because it covers all the three trainings. And the three trainings is the complete life of a Buddhist, right? Right? Sila, uh, Sikha, Samadhi Sikha, Tanya Sikha, right? Sila, Samadhi, Tanya. Sila, moral virtue, body and speech. You have to love yourself. And if you love yourself, you're healthy, your speech is healthy. And uh, our first connection with other people is a bodily connection. We are born from our mothers. We came from the love of our parents. So this is a very basic uh, emotion to the work. So in, in the moral training, the training of speech and body is to express our love, in other words, unconditional acceptance. But even on a simple level, you can see the word unconditional acceptance there. Eh? Uh, of course, I'm speaking very uh, broadly in the Buddhist sense. In the worldly sense, you find there are many other aspects, eh? which we'll look into in a moment. And then, some, uh, samadhi training, training of the mind. You have a higher level of mind, where the connection is more of learning, of curiosity, respect, and so on. It's a connection between teacher, pupil, audience, speaker, and so on. So you find this, you can also use the word connection. Of course, connection is such a dry word, you like that, but interconnectedness, and so on. Then, of course, wisdom. Wisdom must come from love. Because if wisdom doesn't come from love, from love, then it's just knowledge. What does this mean? When you love someone, you find love changes. It's not such a simple thing. Eh? Because if love is the same all the time, it becomes boring and got another problem. So love goes up and down. Love tests us. Love teaches us a lot of things. And I've said again and again, to, to love is to learn. When you love someone, you learn more and more about that person. Good and bad. Strength and weakness, right? You learn to understand the weakness of the person, and according to Zigalo Watasuta, you try to protect this person, help this person in his or her weakness. And then you also know the strength of this person, and you rejoice in the strength. So there are many aspects of love coming to Buddhism. So wisdom is where you, you begin to see things as they are. They're not perfect. They go up and they go down, they're impermanent. So once you accept that, that's wisdom of a very simple level. And then slowly you deepen this understanding and, and you liberate yourself. So that is on the three levels of training. So love is not new in Buddhism. That's why people are surprised that we talk about love at all. Of course, the, the word we normally use is spiritual friendship. Right? So people may ask, okay, where's your sutta reference? <laughs> well, we have spiritual friendship. Vinaya and the suttas. Ananda one day was very inspired. He thought, oh, half the spiritual life is. Uh, Spiritual friendship, eh? because you, you, have, you have connection with the teacher, you listen to the teacher. But the, the Buddha says, no, 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 all of the Dharma, all the three trainings, spiritual friendship. Spiritual friendship is a very high level of love, of connection. 
So the whole of Buddhism, you, you need this kind of love in order to really change yourself. After all, what is Buddhism about? Yeah? I mean, sometimes you can see people, they go, they've gone to temples, go for talks for decades, you know, and still they've not changed. Uh, people telling me they are, they are parents, yeah? father or mother, do all, all kinds of mantras and powerful chants. Yeah? They do all their chanting, and after that, finish chanting, they kick. You get the son or the daughter get kicked. How can someone do all these wonderful mantras? Kick people, where's the compassion? Right? So you, you find people do it mechanically, like tape recorders. One is tempted to say, "Might be reborn as tape recorders in the next life." So that's possible. So you don't have a mind. You you, you become mindless. You know? So you have to show this love. And then when we come to a very important, if you like, philosophical level, love is something you you are. Of course, you can also say you have, you know, right? You have love for someone, right? But you say you love someone, so that's another way of saying it. To have is something that is outside of you. It's not really you. I have something, right? But love is not something you have. The funny thing about love is you never have it if you don't give it away. And only when you give it away, you have it. Right? It's ironic, isn't it? Speaking riddles, if you like. In other words, a simpler way is love is something you must show. Love is something you show to others. There are many ways of talking about this. Right? You've got to show your love to others. And it's a very difficult thing, you know, in, in, in Asia, uh, we are brought up since young, never to show our love, not really anyway. We are always taught to show our love in things, giving things, or maybe indirectly, you know. And we, we are noisy people. Maybe the more we shout each other, the more we love each other, I suppose. <laughs> but then again, <laughs> we become deaf after that, right? So you've got to learn to show this love especially in our loving kindness. So in loving kindness, we're doing just that. We, we, we say it, and uh, then you don't have to say in words after that. Your face, your whole demeanor will exude, will send out this feeling, and people will know it. Even animals know it. You know, my two cats, and we all love this cat. These two cats are really talkative. <laughs> I don't mean they meow, they yow, is another word for making love about mice, my cats. They come and talk to us like humans. For example, I come to them and in the morning, I look at look at me. They say meow. <laughs> they don't say yeah. yeah. They say meow. I say well, good morning to you too. <laughs> so there is wonderful uh, connection, you know, even with animals. I can't talk about the plants. We okay? <laughs> don't say too much. Like this is the plants. You always forget the plants. You're not going too well. I think we've got to say a bit more today. So in other words, you have to build this loving kindness up in you. Right? And, and that is the higher aspect of loving love. Yeah? So here, by way of summary, on page 71, you can see the key ideas, the guide. I've written them on the board behind me. You have the Western concept, or to be more exact, the Greek concept of stages of love, kinds of love, and then the Buddhist concept. They're amazingly close, very close. Yeah? Sometimes I use, when we talk Greek concept, you know, Greece is like in between East and West, you know. just by somehow the Greece has got more West than East, actually. <laughs> it's like in between. So many of the ideas are very similar to the ancient Indian ideas. The words are different, of course. And look at uh, the Greek words, eros. Eros and the eros get erotic, meaning physical, sexual love. But eros is a very broad meaning in ancient Greece. It basically means a love of the body. So you find the ancient Greek artists make beautiful statues of the human figure. Because to them, to be healthy is very important. If you're not healthy, then you know your country will be invaded and you're in serious trouble. In Singapore, you have this similar mentality. You need to be healthy and strong. You've got to go for national service. You're a small country, you know, so we better protect ourselves, that kind of idea. Like a city state. Yeah? But that's the beginning of love, very basic, you want to love your body, keep it healthy, things like that. And in Pali or uh, Sanskrit, say what karma, right, karma. Karma here means 
love of the body. And we have the word kanesu, mechachara, right? Wrong conduct towards sensual pleasures. And that's a, that is one of the precepts we must keep. So in other words, respecting the body. Then you have stolge, family love, familial love, visasa. Visasa literally means uh, trust, trust. Okay. So here, family, the, the first group that we meet in life is, is our family. And, and a family must have love. If a family has no love, my goodness, a dysfunctional family can be very difficult. I can tell you there are lots of dysfunctional family in Singapore. You can, if you're sensitive, you can weep thinking of them. Yeah? But enough weeping. I know lots of people from dysfunctional families, and they're very important to me because they, they write to me about their sufferings. And, and these are really precious, you know, because when people tell you about their suffering, that means they trust you. They, they feel a connection with you. In other words, they're closer to you than to their own families, which brought them the suffering. So it's our duty, our uh, prerogative, you know, to listen to them. It's not just telling us, like, uh, you know, of course, sometimes you can feel, uh, what, what's happening? What, I'm like, uh, you know, a, a, a scratching board, uh, or someone, comes, someone just come and tell us all these things. But why well, they trust you? Because they know you can help them. So many of my reflections you find reflect people who are suffering. Yeah? You will know that when I write, I'll say, someone told me, of course, you don't mention names, because it's not who is suffering, rather, there is suffering. It's not just in this life, but it's going to happen again. As long as human beings exist, there will be this kind of suffering. So it's good to know early. Why is there so much suffering in families in Singapore? Because people tend to think so much in terms of having, measuring things. I've heard now, even when they run temples, committees, they use KPI and you know, measuring all these indexes, how much have you contributed? And people are scratching your head. I come as a volunteer. I don't have to measure how much I can contribute. I do what I can. So you can't measure goodness. You can't measure people's contribution to the Dharma. So you can imagine this idea of having is it creates a lot of problem. So what? Love also must be measured. How do you measure love? So once, once you try to measure things, then you are pushing away love. How much are you worth to me? Right? It's not love. It's investment. So family love is an acceptance of a mother for her child. That's not you're looking at it. It's just like your summary. You're going to talk a lot about this in due course. In Xenia, X-E-N-I-A, Xenia. Hospitality. Zinia means something like uh, hospitality. Yes. Patisantara. Patisantara is very clear. It's uh, hospitality to guests. And this is very important in Asia. In my generation, you know, we've to, to, uh, the, uh, our parents still tell us that guests are very important, right? But we don't hear that much nowadays. The guest is sacred. Okay, so we'll look at this in detail later on. Then you have uh, philia. Philia. Oh yeah, but, uh, just one more point about xenia. It comes from the root word xenos. Eh? So you have xenophobia in Singapore, fear of foreigners. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all foreigners, aren't we? We just had to came earlier. So these are terms which are worth thinking about. Philia. It comes from philos, meaning love, I love, in the learning sense. So philia is a special Greek term for uh, friendly love, love among friends. Pema in, in uh, Pali. Pema, Pema is the noun, Pia is the adjective. Okay. Now what's interesting is that when I was born, my, my mother gave me the name Philip, you know. And, yeah, but, uh, because the, I asked her why, she said because the attendant, there was this, uh, like a sort of a 
maleness. They were very kind to her. And his name was Philip, so he decided to give me that name. So I remember you. I remember used the name since I became a Buddhist. But it, ironically, or rather interestingly, my preceptor, when I became a monk, gave me the name Pia, which is which reflects the same meaning in, in, in Greek and in Pali. Oh, uh, Philip, by the way, uh, in Greek is Philippos. Philos, Ipos. Philos means I love, Ipos, horses. <laughs> so Philip, a, a, a lover of horses. Because the ancient Greeks, you know, they, they love horses. The father of Alexander was called Philip. So agape, okay, this is the magic word, huh? which have been bothered by the Christians also in Christo around. Agape, divine love. Selfless love. This is very close to meta. Now we must be very careful not to misunderstand this all equivalence, exact equivalence. They are not exact equivalence. Okay, these are they overlap, much of them overlap in meaning. Okay? One one reason is because uh, the ancient Greeks they were also Aryan, so they are the ancient cultural roots and the uh, ancient Aryans of India are very they come from the same roots. Okay? So not surprisingly, many of the ideas are similar. Now, there are a lot of things here you, you should read on your own because I won't be covering them some extra reading from literature and so on. So do read them by yourself. I want to talk more about the spiritual aspects of love, especially from the Buddhist point of view. Now, physical love is perhaps the most universal feeling people have. Uh, uh, people get attracted to each other and, uh, and they get married, right? So, so biological love is the kind of love that guarantees our survival. If you don't have that kind of feeling, the whole species would die. The problem is we actually have too much of that. So of course now we think that we don't have enough people in Singapore. But, but if once we have too much, we can have a problem. We're too crowded. Right? So it's better to have a sparse population and live happily with uh, some good level of economics. But the problem is it's quite tricky. You know? The economists are worried that you don't have enough people, then you get the economics so only vibrant, so you have numbers. I think the main problem in this country is not people, it's the space. You need space. You know? So let's hope an, the idea of a common market or, or kind of a union of Southeast Asia so they might come, come to reality. Yeah? So, uh, it was this love of the body. So what's wrong with loving the body? Well, the body is impermanent. So if you are attached to it then, and, and you have a wrong idea about it, you're going to suffer. It, it, it is something you cannot really love uh, uh, as a thing. You, you have to respect it. When you respect something, the word respect is to see something. Res, respect, you know, to see. Yeah? To, to see something as it really is, respect. For example, when you respect someone, we, we, should, we should respect old people, we are told, right? What does that mean? Why should we respect old people? Well, old people, they're not that strong, they, they, they've eaten too much salt, you know, it's not good for them. So, <laughs> so they, they, they need to be taken care of, help around, because they are old, they're not as strong as young people. We, t as we take them for what they are. You also respect a, a child, right? For example, if a little child comes in running around here and making noise, you're not going to give a long lecture to the child, say, don't you know, this is a dumb talk and I'm not supposed to do this. But, well, you know, the child is a child, you know, a child doesn't understand of things, so we, we treat the child with love, with gentleness. But we also know this child will grow up to be an intelligent person, wise person, if we show this love. So respect is accepting a person as he is right now and also seeing a potential in this person. And so respect has got quite a broad term. And of course, uh, if, you look at the, if you look at this various names, they're like a pyramid. It's, it's the bottom is this uh, physical love. So this physical love, of course, is the basis of marriage. All marriages, at least most marriages, there is a certain, certain physical attraction, and that helps the couple to love each other. But if couples really love each other well, they also begin to see as they age how their bodies, you know, weaken, decay, and so on. 
and they, they begin to understand the nature of impermanent source. So in other words, the, the nature of the visceral body has a lesson that it teaches us something very real, that it changes, this physical body changes. You may make beautiful statues of the human body, but those are just rocks and stones, metal maybe. All that we are doing with these images is projecting the impressions of our ideas onto those elements. The idea is they, they is exude central pleasures. They make us think of the five senses. I uh, know stand body, right? And these five senses are all impermanent. So that's what we need to reflect on when, when we talk about the level of love on the physical level. Now then, you have a uh, Stoge, uh, 1, 2, 1.2.2, 2, so Stoge. Stoge is uh, familiar love or family love. Here, of course, it's quite broad. In fact, you can talk a lot about all these things. I've written, I don't know how many pages, 20, 30 pages here. You can write volumes on this, but we're just looking at the essence of it. Family love. It starts with two people. Right? Two people love each other, they get married, and they have children, so you have a family. Usually a family, we would say, uh, biologically related people living under the same roof. But sometimes they, they can live apart. Right? For example, a Chinese family is very big, so you find different families, they live in different buildings. So generally there's some kind of connection by birth, by blood. Now, we're talking about love here. So, in family love, one very common kind of expression of love in terms of family on this uh, level is just above the physical level and just below loving kindness, if you like. There's a very interesting behavior, local behavior, where someone, especially women, not so much in men, women tend to show a kind of, what we call it, in, in the West, they call it clawing love, okay? manja. A sense of uh, this manja, in other words, is to show a sense of softness, weakness, fragility, even to invite support from others whom they regard as stronger. And it's not just in in uh, local Southeast Asian context. Even the Japanese have this attitude. In Japan, it's called amaye. You can see the Japanese word there on page seventy-two. Eh? Roughly translated as indulgent dependence. Of course, we, we cannot again we cannot exactly equate manja with amaya, although there are very similar ideas overlapping. The, the idea among the Japanese is that you have to show yourself as socially dependent on others, a sense of connection that you are not alone. I think it's the influence of Confucianism, the idea of togetherness. I would say you can see this among the greater races also, like the Russians, you know, for example. And they came very close together. I wasn't flying in a plane, I forgot what plane, probably this Russian airline, I think. And so there was these two tough-looking young men sitting beside me, and they were kind of holding hands and hugging each other. Now, they don't look like our people who are gay or anything like that. They, they, they look like, more like soldiers. You know? So you would say a kind of uh, connectedness. And even in Thailand, you find men walking the streets holding hands. I mean, in, in Singapore, you, you can see that among the Indians also, from India especially. So this is a feeling of connectedness. They're, they're non-sexual. They're a sense of connectedness. It's almost like they feel a family outside the family. And, and this helps to you know, give them a sense of security, especially away from their usual family. So these are ways that a human feel safe, secure, functional, even happy. Of course, in, in, in Buddhism, we are we are one against uh, not being mindful. Okay, for example, the story of uh, mother and mother and son here. Mother became a nun. Son became a nun, become a, becomes a monk. 
So this this young man, Wanda, nah, his name is Wanda. So the mother is called Wanda Mata. Wanda, Wanda Mata apparently she's a very well cultivated nun. But the son, the young son, knows the mother is a nun, so he feels familiar with Sasa. Closeness. Eh? So he goes to see the mother and who's living in a nun's quarters. He only wears his sarong and the uh, outer little, you know, little like a thousand single like that. He goes in to see the mother like that. Mother sees him and says, What the? You're a man, you should not, you know, take such liberties. You know? I mean, although I'm your mother, yes, but you're a monk. I'm a, I'm a nun. Eh? So he gave him a, a discourse, you know, on how not to. Uh, misuse with Sasan, not, not to misunderstand his closeness. Or in other words, to see a difference between renunciation and, and the biological family. And as a result of that, this uh, young man became enlightened. So you can see here that the uh, spiritual situation brings wisdom out of a person. So here, here you have another kind of a survey here. And in Xenia, you have this uh, guest friendship. It means guest friendship. Here you find the ancient world from Greece right across Asia. The guest is sacred. Even in ancient Greece, the guest is sacred. You might say in the early years, before the industrial period, the guest is sacred. But once industrial revolution started, when Things began to be measured, time began to be measured, goods began to be measured, prices are put on your time, prices are put on you also. Women had no price, by the way, those days. The women had to fight it, you know, for, for their franchising and so on. So, can you imagine women? It's not that women are priceless, women are worthless. Until they fought for their rights, you know, after the Industrial Revolution. So then, the guest is no more sacred because you come, you eat my food, that costs money, that kind of idea. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you got to be careful. Right? You go to the West, you go, you visit people when they're having their meals, it is not likely you'll get invited to eat. They tell you to wait, I suppose. However, you're in the villages, it's different. People are more friendly. Right? But in Asia, you find one of the most common things we ask each other when you meet, what do you ask? <laughs> Have you eaten and you ate? <laughs> or, they were trying to get a table cup, eat, you know. Sometimes they overdo it, you know. <laughs> and uh, you find you, you after that you put out weight, you know. <laughs> so that is Z. Z. Zinia. <clears throat> and the philia here you find a kind of loyalty among friends. And uh, it's shown among the early monastics. Right? And then Agape. During the, during the time of Plato, just around the 5th century, 4th to 5th century, 5th to 4th century, I think, the, these ancient philosophers, they used the word agape in, in various, various senses. To me, for example, love between spouse, spouses, between husband and wife, love within the family, or to have a common love for a certain activity, like a hobby like that. A non-sexual affection, in other words. Okay. And then the Christians put the term over, and they, they give it deeper meaning. Eh? Then let's look at Chinese conception of love. Now, somehow, the, the, the Chinese never learned to express their love. Why? One reason is because of the domination of Confucianism in their culture. We talk a lot about Confucianism, right? Politicians love Confucianism because Confucianism is a kind of structured love, if you like. Uh, you, you show your love or rather your loyalty according to a structure, hierarchy in society. You, you have the emperor at the top and then the nobles and then the, I mean, you're just giving a rough kind of structuring the merchants, the wealthy people, right? and then the scholars, or maybe the scholars first sometimes, right? And then you have the workers, and then the menial workers, it goes like that. So you've got the, those in the lower ranks got to show their love and respect on 
So you can use luggage, you know, like respect, loyalty to those above. And finally it goes up to the emperor, because the emperor loves this kind of structure. Politicians love this kind of structure. They keep society stable, keeps them in power. There's no love here actually, it's loyalties. It makes power structure works. This is the way Confucius thought. You know? But there was another philosopher who has been forgotten. Mencius, Mingzi, or Mozi. Yeah? He disliked this kind of idea of structured love. It is more like it, it can become nepotic. Right? You, you, for example, you, know, you promote your own families into power. And it's political. So if the emperor tells you what to do, you, do, you have to do it, you know, something like that. So he says that love should be universal, not because of position. You don't respect people because of their position. You respect another person because of their humanity. Isn't that a wonderful idea? This is what Manchus taught. But it never caught on in China. Somehow, if the emperor doesn't like it, nobody will like it. Nobody can like it anyway. Because there is this huge peasantry at the bottom, and they're not very thinking people. They just do things, they just do what's to be told. They're more worried about whether they get their bowl of rice for the day or not. So they're not concerned about all this, whether, you know, universal love again, structured love, you know. But we know today, universal love is very important. By the way, you know, even in our culture here in Singapore and Malaysia, you find this, this idea of structure is still there, you know. It's much weaker than the past, but it's still there. For example, uh, you must not criticize too much of those people above you. I'm talking about a Buddhist structure. I'm not talking about politics here. You cannot criticize too much people above you. You can do trouble sooner or later. It's still there, this idea. And we still feel that people above us, our leaders, are always right, so we just listen to them. But some of us who are thinkers and, and who, who are wiser, who study the suttas very well, then you start telling them, this is not right, something's wrong here. I get feedback every now and then. People are telling me, oh, you know, I go to this so-called Buddhist talk, I listen to these speakers. It's all empty. I don't know, there's nothing much. There's no dharma in what you're talking about. And, and uh, so they just feel more empty than when they came. And, uh, Recently, you know, the latest reflection was about our married life. Yes? We got something, something happy because I want people to feel happy that as, as Buddhists, we, we can still have a happy married life. Someone wrote back and say, you know, I'm so happy. You know, you wrote all these things because I've been hearing all these, uh, some of these, even lamas, you know, even Zen teachers, you know, they're talking strange things, which is not very helpful. They're talking riddles and high-flown things. They talk of compassion and of love, but they never show it. They never show it. So I've unfriended these people <laughs> you know, on Facebook <laughs> and so on. In a sense, I think it's a good thing to do. You know, suddenly you have all these things, it's not very happy things. I think it's, you have to somehow uh, keep away from them so that you're happy. It's one way, unless you can help them. You know? So these are choices we have to make. So Mitch uh, somehow lost his influence. He was overwhelmed by the national structure of beliefs. Right? But we know of him. His teachings are there. But he never really caught on the Chinese mind, universal love. Of course, the Chinese do like to say, under, under the, in the four seas, all men are brothers, you know, and so on. They do have that kind of idea. But that's more of a brotherhood of men, not so much sisterhood. The women have to work it out themselves. There is, there is this idea, but it's not the kind of universal love that the Buddhists were teaching. That only came later. So you have a range of meanings when you talk about love. Eh? And so you find in, in Buddhism, we didn't really talk about non-political love. Love someone for his own sake, to see growth in this person, to help people to change, to be happy. I like to tell people, you want to be a true Buddhist, learn to be happy. Learn to be truly happy. Because if you are truly happy, then you also have love. Or if you if you have love, you're also happy. Then you keep the precepts well. If you're happy, you are full of loving kindness, you are empowered to keep the precepts more easily. 
you are also empowered to help people. You bring, wherever you go, you bring heaven with you. There is this mystical poet, English poet called William Blake. He, he wrote these very beautiful lines in 1794 in his works called Songs of Experience, page 75. He says, love seeketh not itself to please, nor for itself hath any care, but for another gives its ease and builds a heaven in hell's despair. Love is what brings happiness to others, listening to people, talking to them when in difficulty. So sometimes people will come to you and say, Oh, you know, something bad happened to me. My parents treat me like that, or my spouse treat me like this, or my boss did this, and so on. Sometimes we don't have all the answers, you know, because this, these are not easy problems. You are not there, you know. So, what can we do? Just listen, be kind to this person, remind this person of happy days, you know, two stories. Just be there, and you find this person to feel good. There was a time when, when Brother and I we used to despair. You know? People with problems coming to us. Number one, we don't know what to tell them. And these are really bad problems, you know. The next thing is we're worried that we might go crazy ourselves. We keep hearing problems all the time. You know? <laughs> but then the sutta says loving kindness. You have a lot of loving kindness. The next thing is compassion. Then you realize you say, wow, you know, how fortunate I am. I don't have all these problems. And, and this person has so much problem. Then you let this compassion well up and it, it strengthens you. This is the meaning of empowering. It strengthens you to listen to people. And, and people tell you all the problems and, and you, you know, if, if you are not trained, you tell yourself, why can't these people help themselves? Always come here, same problem, right? We, we, we mentally scold them, you know? <laughs> it's very dangerous, you know? So, if you have compassion and you listen to them, you say, wow, this is really bad. This poor person is suffering, you know? I must imagine the pain this person is going through. Hopefully this person sees impermanence on this. And then you tell them all these nice things, all right, reflections for them. She reads it, she cries, people are very happy. A few months pass, and they come back the same problem again. <laughs> yeah, right, another reflection. Why some people are difficult to change, <laughs> and so on. And they read again, they're happy again, you know. So you got to sustain your health. Some people think that, oh, they're very compassionate. There's some great guru coming to town. I just touch you when you're okay. <laughs> Forever. It's no such thing. Right? And then we mention, oh, this great guru healed me. Not true. It comes back. And then, the, you know, the, the loved ones, close friends are the ones who keep healing you. You know, you have a problem. You, you go to them, they listen. And you need this kind of people. You, you need this kind of friends or good listeners. I've been observing couples in Singapore, husbands and wives. I noticed that those who are an island unto themselves, these two couples, huh, man and wife, like uh, Robinson Crusoe and Woman Friday, if you're like that, then you can have problems. Because uh, you've got to extend your friendship to other people also. So couples who have close friends, men who have close men friends, women who have close women friends, whom they can talk to, very important. For example, let's say you had a, say a big quarrel with, with, you know, with your wife or your husband. Some, the normal way people get upset, what do they do? They don't go to deep meditation. Because you go to deep meditation, you go to jhana, no problem. With it. They go to the local park, get drunk. They call it happy hour, actually, it's very unhappy. <laughs> Or worse, you go to prostitutes and everything, and then it matters worse, more complicated. But if you have a friend, you talk to your friend, and your friend says, oh, I understand, and then you find you ventilate, you're, you're able to talk freely, openly, as mentioned in the Sigala Vata Sutta, right? Your secrets he keeps, he tells you his secrets, and he protects you in times of trouble and difficulty. So once you have this kind of friend whom you can talk to openly about your marital life or family life, after that, you're fine. You feel good after that. So you've got to practice the renunciation here, see? Some of my close students do that too, you know? For example, when, when they quarrel, the wife walks off, you know? And then he writes to me and says, oh, you know, my wife walked out. 
I said, good, but she'll come back, don't worry. Like, you don't do anything silly in the meantime, I said. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the evening she comes back and says, there you are. So it's good to just, if you find it, you're not getting anywhere, just go out. You know, go to a peaceful place, go and visit a good old friend or, or teacher. And then if the person is wise and, and, and compassionate, tell your story and then you feel good about it. And you clear, what you're clearing away are the negative thoughts see, about people, about the one you love. And then you come back in the evening and you find everyone feels good about it. So we must remember this, especially in married couples who are Buddhists, to forgive, forget, right? and, and start all again, the new every time. So now we've gone to the Buddhist perspective of love in a bit more detail, 2.1. Love training, I mentioned earlier the three trainings, actually uh, training in different levels of love. So we have five di different perspectives of, of Buddhist love, if you like, it's 2.2. Yeah? In, uh, in this study, we will look at love in five ways, on a personal or as a physical emotion, that is love as central passion. Then there's a relationship between two persons or among small, that is family love. Right, between parents and parents and children. And then as a social emotion, neighborliness and hospitality. And then four, you have what's called developmental relationship, especially in true-hearted friendship. And then spiritual love is the highest of it all, very important, unconditional love. Oh, to all beings and to the world. And this is very important in Buddhism. This is another big difference you know, between Buddhism and other religions, especially the God religions. In the God religions, your love must be directed only one way, to God. So, so you don't show that kind of love to human beings. Humans don't deserve that kind of love. Or if you show that kind of love, it's because for a greater love. So that love is always conditional, in other words. You love others because of God, for God. But in Buddhism, you love people unconditionally. You love people for what they are, completely, accept them. That's how you heal them. So you've got to be strong also. So this is very important to understand. You know? If you have a God idea, you can never have unconditional love. Why? Because you externalize the love that of God out there. But the Buddha says that godliness is inside you. You've got to cultivate the love inside you. That is why you find there's so much problems in the Catholic Church, the organized church, you know, over, over child abuse. Over hundreds of years, thousands, maybe millions of children were abused. It's very sad. So, you have different levels of love, in other words. Basically, you can talk in terms of three levels, you know, animal, human, divine. It's another way of summarizing it. Huh? Animal, human, divine. Animal love is simply a cumulative desire or reactive lust to reproduce ourselves or just to satisfy a feeling. It's got power behind it also, like among the apes or the monkeys, you know, or wild animals. And then you have exploitative love, like the asuras, to exploit others for their own pleasure. And you have addictive kind of love. I mean, the, well, this is not love at all. It's addiction, traitors. Yeah? So you have these different subhuman beings that show the kind of states we can fall into, get caught into, and really suffer. So if you do not understand the nature of love, we can fall into the level of animal love, we can fall into the level of Asura love, we can fall to the level of Preta love. Well, we can't say hell love, not hellish love. That's really a love of pain, it's really crazy. Isn't it? So human love is that of communication, of learning, of giving, right? As, as human beings, one of the things that we, we are good at is giving. One of the things that define human beings. Eh? Of course, uh, 
what do we give? We give things, we give food, but those we give money, you know, those are material things. We also can give non-material things, like we give what our time, we, we give our energy to help around, right? But the highest gift is the gift of the Dharma, to teach people how to be happy for themselves. The gift of the Dharma is not just teaching, teaching suttas and Dharma. It also means teaching people how to be happy. Teaching them how to be happy. It's not easy to teach people how to be happy. Right? You got to know Dharma. Our animals all do, do sometimes, if you love animals very well, they, they do practice giving. At least I've seen it for myself. Very rare, but it does happen. They, they remember this story, the famous story of the cat, do you remember? I had this one really wonderful cat when I was in Malaysia. And uh, I had so many cats, I've forgotten their names. But I remember this one interesting story. I remember I was, I was a monk still at that time, I think. And this cat was a really wonderful cat. One day this cat came to me dragging something. I was sitting there and this cat, this cat was dragging a dead rat and it placed it right before my feet. Just like that. And I said, oh my goodness, he has offered me a rat. <laughs> and I told him, I said, look, I don't take rats. Okay? <laughs> so, but the, your, your sentiment is too that. <laughs> And it's a very interesting thing, you know, a, a, a cat giving me a rat, okay, offering Tana, you know. <laughs> That's all the cat knows. I mean, it would be rather strange if a cat drag a packet of uh, instant noodles, you know. <laughs> that would be very interesting, right? That's all the cat knows, you know. Of course, you can explain this off scientifically. Maybe this cat is imprinted on me, you know, kind of see me as like a parent, you know. Or maybe it will see me like a little kitten, maybe, <laughs> that, that she loves, you know. So she gives the food to me. You know. mother, mother cats tend to do that. But the point is, animals can can show human traits if you love them well. In other words, you are preparing them to be reborn as human beings. I've written an article on this, how animals are reborn as humans or devas even. You know. So if you treat them well, you're, you're helping them in their spiritual evolution, so to speak. And we, have, we also help people in their spiritual evolution if you love them. That is why we, we cannot hate even our enemies. Because we want them to spiritually evolve. So that we, when we meet them in the future, they are happy people, kind people, loving people. They, they are unfortunate to, have, to, to suffer. Because of that, then they hurt other people. So this is why compassion is very important. So how do we distinguish uh, animal love, human love, divine love? Uh, one of uh, those monks I knew long ago, when I was a young man, told me this very funny story. He says, uh, uh, if a boy sees a girl the first time, that is uh, human love. He falls in love. He says, oh, pretty girl. No? And then he looks again second time at this girl. Uh, that is, uh, no, first time, sorry, first time is divine love. And he looks, oh, beautiful girl. This feel I'm in heaven, you know? Divine love. Yeah? Then he looks again second time and says, hmm, that's nice, nice hat, isn't that, you know? Human level, start noting, address, phone number, right? Human love, no? And the third time he looks, that is animal love. Okay, <laughs> and then he wants to have a good date with this person, so, you know, all right? So that's one way to remember it, yeah? Love, it essentially, is a, it's a sensitive feeling. And it should be sensible also. Why? Because love has to do with the senses. When we love people, the most common thing is through looks, right? We recognize our love one through looks. Or we fall in love through looks. Sometimes we fall in love through voice. We listen, right? Then smell, taste, feeling. Right? And love is also a form of contact. So, but we have to understand that all these uh, sensations, all these uh, sensitivities are impermanent. It is the sixth sense, the cognitive sense, the, the mind behind it or the heart behind it that makes it meaningful, that makes us understand the nature of this love. We have to reflect on the impermanence of it all. 
have to understand that it is because we are attached to one of these senses that that lust arises. Lust means we want more and more of the physical aspect of this love. Whereas if you want more and more of the mental aspects called learning. Okay, so this at least is very important to reflect on. Right? So love in other words has its objects. Whereas loving kindness, in a sense, when it is well cultivated, it has no object. May all beings, not one particular being. Yeah? Of course we can begin one particular being, but ultimately we must say all beings. Yeah? Now the next question we should ask ourselves, why do we love? Page 80. Why do we love? Yeah? Why do we fall in love for the matter? Well, the simple answer is latent tendencies. We have feelings, greed, hate, de delusion, or, or, or lust, ill will, ignorance, deep down inside us. Or another way of saying it is we have our past karma. We are born with this bag baggage of past karma. The people we marry, probably we married them in previous lives too. So, once this, this beautiful story of this young man and, and a girl, how they were kind to each other, in the end they got married in the by the story, very beautiful story. The stepfather was trying to kill him, but this woman helped him. So they both married in the end. Then the Buddha said something like, uh, if you treat each other well in this life, and you have been kind to each other in the past, then you will love each other. Your love will grow like a lotus top of the water. So, in other words, the fact that we fall in love with someone, with your spouse, your partner, is very likely because of past karma, past connection. But you need present good conditions to sustain that love. So then in the next life, you become better at it. It grows like that. Yeah? So, you, love, in other words, is something you should do, you should practice. So biological love, in other words, is purely of the body, so that the species continue. And sexuality is what is the name we give to this kind of activity. Uh, and, and sexuality is, one of, is the most selfish form of love. Because the eye is very big here. Right? When we talk about sex, it's always the, the eye. I want the pleasure, right? so sexuality is, is the most selfish form of love. And on the other extreme, loving kindness is the most open of uh, love. Then you might say, what about compassion, gladness, the community? They are all forms of loving kindness. Compassion is loving kindness expressed to people who are less fortunate. Gladness is loving kindness expressed to those who are more fortunate than we are. Equanimity is what strengthens us in face of our success and failure. That the way the world is, we, 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 are, we have done our best, so we just look on, undaunted, peacefully. So they are all aspects of loving kindness. And uh, the love of the Dharma is uh, another, aspect, another way of talking about loving kindness. Now, the love of Dharma is interesting because if you have love for the Dharma, you may also feel a sense of suffering. There's a special term for this, called udacca, restlessness. If you truly love the Dharma, you will also, if you're not awakened, feel a sense of restlessness. It is normal. You have to understand this. For example, if you love the Dharma, you may think, why can't people study suttas, be happy? Why can't they straight away study the suttas so that they learn all their problems so they get into trouble? But they tell you, oh, they're very cheap, uh, difficult, I cannot understand, boring, this and that. Yeah? And when they have trouble, they come to you. All right? Well, that's the way things are. They, they just don't have the time, the inclination, or the wisdom. So, yeah. When you feel like that, that's udacca. It's quite normal. Yeah? This can happen even to very deep meditators, you know. 
So they're going to China, so then they come up. Then they say, oh, you know, all these people, what? if only they know all this China, all these things. So they only, they kind of turn out hard work. But they become non returners if they have this slight feeling for the world. Right? So what if they can let go of Udacha also, they become arahats. So Udacha is that sense that, you know, you feel like the world change. That's why equanimity is so important. Right? What I'm saying here, this is a normal feeling. If it stays there, it's okay. You know, when you when you learn to let it go, that's the right time. So don't rush it. If your mind is truly calm, you can cultivate yourself. You will not have to let it go. So today I'll stop here. Is uh, we we'll continue with uh, three, two, three next week. Any questions? The yes. responses of being um, probably from a past life, that's why you get married again. But I heard a lot of people being that bad in bad marriages, they will, um, what do you call it, tolerate all the sufferings just not to get, to meet the other person the next time. Is it a right <laughs> kind of thinking? Because I heard a lot of stories about uh, wives or husband abuse, just, you know, just mm -hmm. to take it all and yeah. you want to meet the person the next time. Uh, well, it depends who's teaching them, what teachings they're following. You know? uh, well, in, in the traditional culture, you also have arranged marriage. You know, you find arranged marriage, uh, it can be quite tricky. People, whether they love each other or not. But I, I have friends who, who have been, whose marriage has been arranged, and, and they are they're very happy and successful people. You know, they're earning more money than we are. Anyway. They're very happy. And so it's hard to say uh, sometimes. The, the point is, as I said, there are two ways you can meet again, through kindness and love or through strong hatred for each other. So the more you hate each other, the more likely you're going to meet each other too. So why not show love, if not at least loving kindness? In other words, uh, well, you have a choice here. You know? I mean, it's not an easy thing to deal with. Let me close telling this with this story. You know? uh, there, there was this monk who has been teaching for a long time about compassion, meditation, things like that. So this woman has been coming, listening, feeling very good, doing the meditation, also very, very happy. But she didn't say anything. Just come, goes away. You, know, you find a lot of people like that. Just come, do meditation, listen to my talk, no questions. They don't even talk to anyone else. They come, they go, come, go. Like that. So you've got to watch out for such people. Just be there, ready for them. They probably have a story to tell you. Then one day, she came smiling very happy after a few years, you know. So the teacher asked him, mm, I've seen you coming here every year, but you never smile. You just come, do your meditation, listen to my talk, no question, and you go home. But today you are happy. Can you tell us what happened, you know? I said, oh, you know, I've been coming for many years here, meditating, and listening to my talk. And you, the teacher, tell me, even though people hurt us, if your spouse hurt you, Send them your loving kindness, be patient with them, keep sending loving kindness to them. Well, my husband has been beating me every time. I, I come here because this only time he doesn't beat me. And when I go back, I get beaten again. But still, I keep sending loving kindness to him. And one day, when he was less drunk, he asked me, he says, why do you let me beat you up? No? Why, why is it you don't get angry with me? And then he said, well, you know, I've been listening to Donald Dobson to show my loving kindness to you. And the teacher said that, you don't really want to hurt me, you're not happy with something, and, and, and here I am always near you and who loves you, so I'm the one who receives the brunt of your unhappiness. And, and if that makes you happy, I suppose uh, I'm happy for you. So the poor man broke down. You know, he said, oh dear, I should have done this. So the husband changed because of that. So that's why she's so happy. I tell you, this is very rare. <laughs> She's so patient, must be a manifestation of Kuan Yin, I suppose. <laughs> Other people will tell you women rights, so tell you, sue the husband, uh, take him to court, whatever. <laughs> and then you'll be doing that again in the future. So, in other words, learn Dharma early. Prevention, prevention is better than cure. That's why now, in, with our email, we'll tell people, hey, come and send the emails of your friends over before they need to send an email. <laughs> They're in early, learn to love early, then they're prepared for problems. Prevention is better than cure. Okay, on that note, we 
the close of study for today. Let us do a short reflection. They say love makes the world go round, but it is also true to say suffering makes the world go round too. In other words, to love, we also sometimes feel pain. It is a package deal. So we've got to reflect on the nature of love. To love is to learn. And if we look at this, we find if we allow ourselves, we've really learned a lot about ourselves, about other people. The idea is to go on living our lives. And as we do that, we begin to see clearer what we can do, what we can't do, what we should do, and what we should not do. This is the power of reflection. When we learn Dharma, then we are able to polish the lenses which we look through more clearly. We begin to put the pieces together, we begin to understand I mean, the nature of love, the nature of our feelings, so that we can respond to Dharma. The most important thing is to cultivate loving kindness within ourselves, never to look down upon ourselves, to see ourselves as failures, nor to abuse us. Once we have this loving kindness, then we begin to see the goodness in others also. And when we do that, we surprise them, and they also will respond with a softer heart. Of course, we need to work on this. It's not something easy, but it is possible. Is the best way to live because we meet again. Reflecting in this way, we create very good mental karma. By the power of this karma, may we learn to love wisely, may we learn from loving, even from pain, may we learn wisdom and strength. And in our joy and and uh, let us share our wisdom with others too, so that they do not suffer or end their suffering. But above all this good karma, may we in this life itself attain spiritual liberation, namely streamlining. In these peaceful moments too, let us send our loving kindness to all those people who are important to us, to all those who work for the Dharma, that they may be closer to the Dharma, for those who have difficulties, that they may see themselves more clearly and happily in the Dharma and be wise. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu.